Greetings, everyone, and welcome to The Codex Show, episode number 14 for the fall semester of 2017. Let's give it a hand. And I got people calling me up right now, so I'm going to move my phone over here. Um, my name is Peter James, and I am your host here for the College of DuPage Entrepreneurship Club. We are located here on the beautiful campus of College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois, one of the largest two-year colleges in the country. At Kodak, our goal simply is to expose students and the local community members to entrepreneurs and small business owners. By them sharing their story, we'll show how entrepreneurship is definitely an option and when your education is complete. So, um, of course, we're here at COD, very excited about it. I'm a professor here on campus. I'm a business professor, an entrepreneurship professor, and the show has kind of evolved here. We got a new logo, we got new officers, we got new guests here as well, and, um, and here we are. What is this, uh, October 12th? So, cool, very cool. So those of you who are watching on, uh, on, on behind the camera there, welcome again. Um, today, I am, without further ado, we got a special guest going on. His name is Gregory Hyde. And Greg, say hello, everyone. Give Greg another hand. So Greg is a musician, a speaker, an author. He, like, you do everything, man. So, <laughs> so without further ado, let's just jump right in. And I want to say, first of all, welcome to the College View page. Thank you. And uh, let's just get it right in there. What? Okay. Would tell us a little bit about what all you do, and then maybe we'll even go back a little further and say how you got started. So first and okay. foremost, uh, welcome, yeah. man. What do you do? Thanks, thanks. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I, I, I am in quite a few different things right now. So I have a company that focuses on music, and so music or entertainment in some format. So live music performances, both myself as well as booking some other acts. Uh, and then that has led into some other revenue streams, such as having a recording studio and nice. doing work that revolves around audio production and speaking and uh, authoring some, some books along the topics of what I've been able to achieve in the business space. So that's kind of cool because actually I know a few uh, students here in the audience who have some speaking or even podcasting type of ab a aspirations yeah. as well. So we'll dive into that a little bit. So mm -hmm. how did you get started in what you do? Is, let's start out with the music business. How did you get started? Yeah. Is, this a, is this a long, when you were a toddler, you just took up a mic and is that what <laughs> it was? <laughs> no, actually no. I, I did grow up in a musical household and so there was always music being played around. My dad was a guitar player. My parents both sang at church and so Music was just a normal thing around our house, but I wanted to be in art, and so I, I, my life's goal was to illustrate comic books. And uh, I went to school. Uh, I got an advertising design, uh, like a Votech, you know, technical school completion certificate, that nice. type, sort of thing. Nice. I got a job right out of high school working as an illustrator, and wasn't really thrilled with the industry. Right. <laughs> and, um, and then went on to doing web design and other things, same, same thing in the art space, but really coming to terms with the fact that that industry wasn't, wasn't lighting my fire. Yeah. And so I came to a term of what do I want to do? And I thought, well, I've always kind of bumped around and played guitar and sang in bands just as a hobby, sure. but I really enjoy that. Would there be any way I could turn this into something that could pay and actually pay some bills with this? And so that's where that started. And it was by going down that road that led to me being able to do music full time. There were a lot of bumps and bruises along the road. Um, but that's, that eventually came about uh, about 12 years ago. I've been a full time musician for, for 12, 12 years. And then those other aspects came about through that. So I like your story. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons I'm really passionate about entrepreneurship is because I think most of us, when we go work for somebody else, we ultimately get to that point where we're like, there's got to be more to life. There's got to be yes. more to my life. <laughs> I want to go do something else. And now if yeah. you've had some kind of entrepreneurship or exposed to it, then you might go down that path and start your own business or, or sell your own stuff or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But it sounds like you figured that out early in your life. Thankfully, yes, I did. But even when I wanted to, to be a musician, I was going about it the route of how do I get a record label deal or how right. do I essentially work for somebody else? <laughs> um, so it would be the same thing as if you wanted to be a shoe designer, you're trying to get a job at a shoe company so you can be a shoe designer sure. and then eventually you decide, I'm just gonna make my own shoes. Um, so it was like I'm trying to get a job as a musician on a record label and then eventually figuring out 
I should just do this on my own. How, how is that process? You know, I hear I hear horror stories about the music industry <laughs> right. trying to get a label, trying to get mm -hmm. airtime, and all that kind of stuff. Give us a, a yeah. sneak, sneak uh, peek into that. Uh, okay, it's 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 kind of like the mafia. <laughs> <It's>, um, <laughs> there's a lot of you know really unscrupulous backdoor deals going on. Uh, people who have to, uh, without getting too graphic, sacrifice a lot yeah. uh, in order to get what they want. And once I was having those conversations with record labels and some people who were management of these people that I'd grown up admiring, realizing I'm going to have to give up quite a bit to, yeah. to get this. And that wasn't, that wasn't a deal I was willing to make. Yeah, that's interesting too. So I, I'm, I'm getting ready to go on a super tangent. Today, yeah. the music industry has changed. Yes, uh, completely. Whereas, you know, the normal path was to go work with a label, um, the record company, but now you're seeing more and more artists deviating from that, yeah. starting their own thing on uh, social media or YouTube for that matter. Why is that? What's going on? What's the shakeup all about? Uh, a lot of it is the, the ability that we have now to have some control over what we're doing. Sure. So in the past, the only way you were going to get any sort of notoriety, I mean, even, gosh, in the 60s and 70s, the only way you could ever cut a record was to be on a label. There was no way you'd be able to afford getting in a studio and, and making your own demo unless you were just really financially well off enough that you didn't need a label. Um, and that's changed. So the, the, the things that it takes to make a record, anybody can get for very little investment these days. Um, the ability to get your music out to the masses mm -hmm. is extremely easy and inexpensive. Um, that's kind of a two-edged sword in that, like, I've got the same access to the same audience that Adele and Justin Bieber and the Eagles have. The downside is now there's this glut of like anybody can just sing something into their iPhone <laughs> and it's on iTunes in you know ten minutes. Um, but that said, you can you can reach the same audience, you can have the same kind of impact. It's just now up to you yeah. to market it, um, to to brand it well, and to make it something that people are going to come to, uh, so that you can draw people into the the product that you're making, rather than I record it and then I just let the record label handle that for yeah, me. Interesting. But, uh, but you get to keep <laughs> you know, nice. the, the income uh, that comes in, a, a much greater percentage. I think a lot of people don't understand yeah. uh, that, you know, for back in the, the golden age when people were really making a ton of money in the music industry was when CDs were the main format. And for every CD that got sold, somebody like a Justin Timberlake or Alanis Morissette or whoever, they were probably seeing maybe 10 cents for every one of those CDs that got sold that cost 15 bucks. And that's if they were somebody like that, that had the kind of star power that they could negotiate that sort of a deal. People don't realize that. Yeah. People think it's the margins much bigger. So 10 right. cents of every CD, that's pennies. Yeah, and that's after the record label recoups every dime they put into promoting your record, which is usually about a million bucks to get your song on the radio. Right. So it was, it's, it's not a, it's not a formula for success. Um, in fact, sometimes it can be just the opposite. Yeah, and now that um, CDs are not the main way that students or anybody, for that matter, listens right. to music. Right. Um, the the margins are even lower now Much. because now all every if I if I ask if I show of hands and actually let me go ahead and do this, who listens to CDs regular in this regularly in this room? <laughs> Raise your hand. No one. <laughs> so, so now the margins are much smaller for an, um, right. an artist who's actually trying to make it even smaller because now if, if, I, if I go a step further, a lot of you are streaming uh, and maybe borrowing or uh, sharing, right? Spotifying mm -hmm. for that matter. Mm -hmm. And if they're, doing, if they're using sp on Spotify, what's the margins like then? Uh, let's see, I, I had like 36,000 plays of one particular song on Spotify and I, I checked the, the little royalty payout sheet and for those 36,000 plays I made 0 .008 cents. Yeah. So nobody's getting rich doing this through, <laughs> through Spotify. Yeah. Um, yeah. So all those artists you see on TV we live in that lifestyle. Yeah and I mean like back in back in the 80s when you had the, like the hair bands who were all driving Rolls <laughs> Royces and living in mansions and all that stuff the record label was fronting the money to to make it look like they were living that lifestyle none of that belonged to them and that's why you saw all the rags to riches back to rags stories 
was because they didn't have any of that in their pocket. It was all uh, an image that the, the label was pushing forward. So if you want fame, you need, well, nine again, 999 times out of 100,000. We're not good with numbers. I'm a musician. Give me a break. <laughs> um, uh, I did this so I wouldn't have to do math. Um, but most of the time, I'll say it that way, uh, if you want fame, you've got to go through a record label. If you want to play the Super Bowl halftime show, you're going to need to be on a label to make that happen. But if you want to be financially successful and pay your bills with it, a label is probably the last thing that you want to do. Hmm. And that's just the way it shakes out now. And, and then to finish off that part of the conversation, you know, you see a lot of artists now going on the road. Mm -hmm. That's like a main part of their existence. Yeah. Uh, is that where they're making their money as well? It is. And that's another thing that's flipped upside down. It used to be that you would go out and tour to promote the record because you'd make so much money off somebody buying a physical CD or cassette or whatever it was back in the day. Nowadays, touring is where they make all the money. And then the recordings are just an advertisement for, I hope you come see me when I come through your town because I'm not making anything off that recording. Yeah. But if you come out and you buy a $35 t-shirt <laughs> and you know uh, we make some money because you apparently buy enough beer at the United Center to make it worth their while to have us come fill the place right. out, then, then they can make a lot of money that way. Wow. Yeah. That's something, man. Um, yeah. Hey, listen, I'm asking a whole lot of questions. Those of you here in the, in the studio audience, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and I'll identify you. Make sure you speak up so the, the folks behind you in, in the camera world and the, in the YouTube world can also hear your question as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Sarah Liz Jimenez. I'm the manager of the Latino Outreach Center here at College of DuPage. Yes, sir. I listen to a lot of music on YouTube. How does that play in with all of this? Uh, it, it's a similar thing. Each, each platform right now, like Pandora, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, they are all setting up their own parameters on how they pay out royalties and how they even have algorithms that send music out to their listener base. So it, it's different on a case-by-case a -case basis. Um, and YouTube's an interesting thing because it actually brings in video as well. And there are different laws and legal structures around the payouts of royalties based upon if your music is used on a TV show or in a film or just put to a video of your three-year-old dancing in the living room, or if there's no video component to it, and if it's put on terrestrial radio, so it's coming over an airwave, or if it's actually going in a digital format, it's, it can get pretty confusing. But um, uh, I guess, is there a more specific answer that you were looking for about how that might? No, I was kind of like, I mean, because you have all these, I mean, I, you know, like one of my friends is like, don't you get your music on iTunes? I'm like, no. <laughs> I just go on YouTube and listen to it for free, you know? Right, right. And, and a lot of people do. Uh, the way that that works as far as artists getting paid is a lot of times YouTube will have advertisements on their, their videos. And so those advertisements are bringing, at, bringing in ad revenue to YouTube. And they've got a pretty good structure in place to know which videos are getting the most plays, and so how much money should be distributed to the people who have the ownership rights of those videos. So. If you put an ad on one of your videos and there's a Coldplay song in the background, Coldplay's getting every dime. <laughs> and so that's, that's going to go to them. Um, and that's why if you put up a video of your three-year-old dancing in the living room and there's a Prince song in the background, his estate will shut you down. <laughs> and they will take your video off of YouTube and you might get your account suspended because he's, he was very, very picky about that. Um, so it, it, it depends. And, and if there's multiple songs used, then those payouts could go multiple different directions. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a little bit the Wild West in, in a lot of these, on a lot of these platforms right now. Good, good. Um, good. Yes. What outlet do you think was most successful for you? Um, for me, uh, as far as a digital outlet online, I see the best payouts as well as the best fan engagement off of Pandora believe it or not. Wow. There, there are not as many people listening to my music on Pandora as elsewhere, but the payouts are better and I see more people who eventually make it to my Facebook page or make it to my website mm -hmm. or wind up shooting me a note on Twitter or adding me on uh, Instagram because they came to me because of Pandora. I think with Spotify, uh, A, I haven't marketed that channel as much as some other people do mostly because I know the results aren't going to be worth my time because of the, the low payouts. 
Um, with Spotify, the, the best thing you can do there is get on a really high profile playlist. So one of the ones that Spotify pushes. And so if you get added to one of their playlists and they're pushing it out to, I don't know, 80 million people, <laughs> and then they just let that play through their playlist in the background you know, while they're baking brownies or something, then you could actually see a, a decent return on it. But it's very difficult to do that. Um, and that's, that's why I've, I've, um, I've actually done better off of physical CD sales, oddly enough, <laughs> up until I'd say about a year and a half or two years ago. But that's because of an age demographic. Obviously, the people in here, like the majority of our society, are getting their music through downloads or primarily streaming. Yeah. But there's still a demographic of people who they want a physical product. It's almost like a, it's, it's almost um, like buying a keychain to them. It's not even that they're going to listen to it. It's like, look what I got. He signed it, you know? And they have something physical they can put on a mantle or, or, or something. <laughs> um, as well as, that's just the way some people did things. And, and they, <laughs> you know, they don't want to change. And uh, I played one corporate event where they had I don't know, a thousand people there, and they put together 750 grab bags of different things from the from the conference, and so they bought 750 of my CDs to tuck into these little bags. I have no idea how many people actually listen to it, but some people just want to have the physical thing to buy. So that's been the the most income, but that comes rarely, honestly. So that's actually a good segue type question yeah. to now your streams of income. How are they coming in? So I know. We started out mm -hmm. the conversation talking about some of your speaking, your your writing. You mentioned even you have studio things like that. What right. is um, how did you have to pivot? Obviously, the the market made you have to pivot to yeah. a certain extent. But now, now that you've pivoted your business, where are your streams and and how are you marketing those streams as well? Uh, yeah. So the the lion's share of income for my business for for Skyblind Incorporated. That's that's my my corporation is coming through live performances, which is just me showing up and either with a guitar and just doing a solo acoustic thing or with my band playing a show. And there's kind of a hierarchy of that where I play some local you know, restaurants and pubs and bars and things like that just to kind of fill in the dates. And then there are private events, which are going to be people like throwing a, a party or some kind of festival or something like that that I'm playing. Or there's corporate events where it's a corporation saying, hey, we're having our national sales meeting, and at the end of the day of sitting around in a hotel room, we want to go out and have a good time. And so, uh, and those are nationwide, so I'll fly around and, and play some of those for different corporations. And those are extremely profitable. Um, so that's where most of the income is coming in. Then I'd say next to that is recording studio work, mm -hmm. which up until about a month ago, again, you've you kind of pivot when you see the opportunity and when you've got the skill set to do it. Um, and some of these things I didn't see coming down the pike until you know, a week before I stepped into it. Um, but up until now, I've been doing recording projects for myself. I record all of my own uh, music in-house. I also would record uh, things. I've done um, interviews for, for NPR. Like I'll go on, on site and record the interview and then send off the file to them so that they can air it on the, on the air. Nice. Um, different things like that, doing projects for other musicians, even I had a guy who was on an Air Force base in Germany and he'd send me stuff he'd record on his phone and I'd mix it for him and send it back and um, that was primarily it. Just within the last month I've switched over to um, recording audiobooks, which was never on my radar, so, but so that's like the um, what do they call it? The voiceover? Yeah, um, yeah. They they break that up and saying voiceover is technically like when you watch a commercial and right, George right. Clooney is like, you need to buy this. <laughs> um, but uh, an audiobook narrator, narrator, I guess, narrating right, right. and producing an audiobook is if I take a copy of whatever book they send me and I read through it and kind of act out the parts and, yeah. and whatnot, and somebody listens to it on the metro on their way into Chicago every morning. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's turned out to be more lucrative than the band work and recording for some other businesses like NPR would be. So I'm doing a lot more audiobooks now. It's kind of <laughs> interesting. It's, 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 it's actually a unique conversation as well because um, those of you who are um, really big in a certain industry or you have your hobby or your thing, you are on the cutting edge of what's going on in that industry. So you know how the industry pivots for that matter, right? So 
just as he's pivoting to audiobooks, which are hot right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm actually listening to quite a few right now because I have more time to do that than I do right. to read. That's where you pivot to because you're seeing more of an income stream from that perspective as well. Right, right. And it's because I took the initiative to learn the recording studio techniques that I did yeah. that I was able to step into it. And uh, the way that I got into the audiobook thing was because I wrote a book because somebody asked me to speak on this topic. And so they were like, well, if you're going to do more speaking things, you should have a book. So, all right, I'll write a book on what I know. So I write a book. And then they're like, hey, you should do an audio book of that. So I do an audio book. And then somebody hears it. And they're like, you know what? You should do audio books. I'm like, well, I can do that. Yeah. So, um, But it's it, customer demand. It's customer demand. It's totally finding out what people are looking for right now. And where am I going to you know, f fill a pain point or um, solve a problem that somebody has and being willing to adjust to that. And, and I had to do that with, with the music career to begin with as yeah. well because I thought, all right, the way that you do this yep. is you make great music, you just make the best songs you can, you're the best performer you can be, and then you go out there and then you're successful and you, know, you get signed and you're on cribs, everything's awesome and wonderful. Yeah. And, and that doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. And so I'm originally from, from Oklahoma, and so I moved up here and I was starting all over. Didn't know anybody, didn't know the scene, didn't know anything. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to start calling around to all these venues that are the cool, ven you know, the Metro and Double Door and Shubas and all these places and asking them, what do you look for out of somebody who's like the, the bands that you always want them coming back, the artists that you always are thinking, I want these guys. Yeah. And you're willing to pay them more than you pay anybody else. Who are those people and why? And so they would give me a list of names. And then, I, I don't know, I called probably 10 places. And so they'd say, all right, they show up on time. They don't get drunk on stage. They bring people out. Uh, they're easy to work with. I mean, nobody, nobody mentioned the music. Nobody mentioned, <laughs> and they are groundbreaking musically. Nobody mentioned, and that guy's the best stinking guitar player I've ever seen in my life. Never. And so I was realizing the things that were making them seek these musicians out was that they were easy to work with, and they were responsible, and, well, I can do that, you know? Uh, so it totally changed my my. my perspective of what I was aiming at. And you've essen you essentially did your own market research. Yes, you exactly. And exactly. what happens a lot of times when we start our own businesses, we have an idea, right? And we like, oh yeah, I'm really good at it, or somebody told you you were good at it, so just go ahead and do it, but you're not adjusting to when your customer tell you, hey, I, li I don't like this, I like it the way you do this, but if you like it this way, you want to keep doing it this way, mm -hmm. but then you're losing money if you're not right. able to adjust. He has been able to adjust regularly on, on the regular and he probably will again as the market dictates yeah. that he needs to adjust also yeah. go ahead Florian. yeah yeah so in your book the side hustle how'd you get uh damon john to to write a review for you I, i'm sorry how did how'd I get you get damon john uh shark tank to, to write a review for you on your book did i get damon john to write a review yeah, for me from my book Really? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to check this out. <laughs> wow. He's been pivoting so okay, well right, that yeah. actually Damon John wanted to go ahead and write a review. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, that, that's, that's a factor. Sometimes you don't know who you know, who knows somebody <laughs> important. Um, that's good. That's classic. Truthfully, that's, that's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm shocked by that. But... Um, I've been hearing a, a few people mention the book. Um, I, I sent it out to quite a few people when, when I finished it, just to get outside perspectives yeah. as, as well as inside. So people in the music industry, people who do other things. And so one of the women I sent it to, she runs a dance studio. And she said, I'm going to have every single dance instructor I have read this book. And another guy, he's, he does woodworking and you know, makes things out of leather. And he was like, me and my whole shop are reading this entire book. I'm, it's a requirement if you work here. And at first I was kind of shocked by that, but then it's, it really falls into those same things that yeah. those managers were saying. They were looking for somebody who was easy to work with. They were looking for somebody who was responsible. And in the music world especially, I think people confuse the skill that you have or in other industries, the product that you make and your ability to profit from it. And they're two completely different things. So it's like, well, I'm the best guitar player in the entire world. I'm, not me. I'm, I'm saying, what if? That doesn't mean I can do anything with this to actually profit myself. Yeah. It just means I'm a really good guitar player. It doesn't mean 
I'm good at making a living as a guitar player. Um, and so I think that's, that's what the book really focuses on. So I hope Damon from Shark Tank <laughs> 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 took that away from it or you, something. You actually that's, said something wow. that's really um, inspiring. Um, a lot of us who are watching and even here in the room, you know, we think, oh, I don't have a talent, mm -hmm. you know. But you even just screamed that, you know what, if you can do some responsible things, like mm -hmm. know how to talk to people, know how to be on time, be personable, you know, um, know how to bring an audience. Wow, that's not really talent laden type stuff. It's just right. actually being on top of your game type stuff. Exactly. And and with musicians, <laughs> we're we're notoriously awful at all those things. Um, the the stereotype is you know lazy and irresponsible and you know probably inducing too many chemical substances into their body um, and all of those things. So. Just by not being that, yeah. it, it, it honestly put me ahead of the game a little bit. Nice. But uh, one, of the, one of the other pivot points you were talking about, going back to music, um, and this is almost, it, it's hard to wrap my brain around still, but I haven't released a new album of music in I don't know how long, a couple of years. And I actually have no intention of doing it anytime soon. And the reason being because of seeing sales decline and not just sales decline, but spins decline as well uh, online. And there was one guy who has always been a big champion of mine. He's always supported everything I've done. He's been just a huge cheerleader for me. He has a tattoo on his side, like that covers his entire side of the chorus of one of my songs. Totally weird. Uh, wow. <laughs> it's honor, honored, honored by it, but it was kind of strange. Um, but uh, anyway, so he, uh, all about, my music career. It's been great. Well, I noticed he was not buying the last album that I put out. And I thought that was really strange. Sure. Like, why is, he's all about me, he hasn't bought this record. And I've mentioned it a couple times, like, hey, have you heard that? And he's like, nope. I'm like, hmm. Well, then he hired me for an event, and I played this event. It was on the rooftop at his apartment. And there's all these people out there, and, and he comes over to me afterwards, and he was like, this is the best. He was like, the best times I ever have with my friends are when you're playing for us. And that's when I realized that's why he likes me. That's his thing. He doesn't need another album of my music. He is not looking for me to write new songs. He's mm -hmm. looking for me to just show up and hang out with his crew and play songs while they have some drinks. And then I started asking some other people and found out there were more people who had that same perspective. Wow. And so I was realizing it's more direct entertainment that some people are seeking from me rather than when is Gregory Hyde going to release a new record of music. And at first I struggled with that because I'm like, well, I love like, you know, the police or the Foo Fighters and these are my favorite bands and they put out a new record like every year or two. And so I should be doing what they're doing. Um, but at some point you have to realize yeah. I, I might just be making a vanity project here that's not really going to go anywhere. And am I doing it for me, or am I doing it for them? Good stuff. That's, yeah. uh, that's great. That's um, good insight, for sure. Questions from the studio audience? Let's go here, then we'll hit here. Yes. So my younger brother is actually trying to get into the music industry. He's doing yeah. a lot of uh, land tracks. He just recently made a music video and things like that. But he's going through that phase of He's seeing himself spend a lot of money on it, but he isn't getting a profit back. And I keep trying to tell him, maybe you should diverse yourself in it. And everyone's telling him, maybe go to school, do something else. How, do, how can I inspire him to keep going with what he's passionate about and maybe go back to school and maybe learn how to mix or you know, do the videos and different things like that so that you can make money in different areas in the music industry. Right. Well, I would say most of the people who are in the industry that I know of right now, um, as I'm thinking, all of the people that I know who are doing well enough to pay their bills at it are diversified to some extent because it's, it's a roller coaster, you know, and you're gonna have great seasons where it's just like you're on top of the world and the snowball's rolling downhill and the calls are coming to you. And then I don't care who you are, every single person I've known in the industry, no matter how big they've been, they've hit a dry patch where things slow down. But people didn't see them in the public light anymore maybe, 
but they were still back over here like producing tracks over here or laying down drum tracks on this guy's album or I, I went on tour in Japan for three months with this guy because they needed somebody and so it's being able to, to do a multitude of things really opens up your options mm -hmm. as well as you're going to be more knowledgeable when if you're behind the mic performing if you know what the guy on the other side of the glass is doing it just makes that go so much better and it enables you to be able to speak into that to to recognize when a problem's happening and be like hey I, I noticed that you're doing this uh, could we oh yeah gosh I'm out of my mind what was I thinking um, having those kinds of cons conversations and being able to kind of have more control over what you're doing because I've I've not yet met an artist in my life and myself included especially who didn't want more control over what they were doing <laughs> and didn't want to be able to guide the process and guide the ship because as an artist I mean you're expressing yourself you're you're putting your thoughts and your feelings out there and your emotions and to have somebody else step in and go all right now I'm gonna take it and do this with it I mean that's a that's a difficult thing yeah. and so the more you know the more you can control that conversation and the more confidence people are gonna have in you to be able to do it um, and I mean, there have been seasons for me where, especially through the winter months in Chicago, people yeah. don't really want to go out and you know see a band or a guy play in a bar. They'd rather just sit at home and you know Netflix. So, which understandable. But having the recording studio got me through those times mm. when I've got some guy. You know, it's bright and sunny over in you know wherever it is, Cameroon, where I'm getting some some <laughs> some tracks from, and. Uh, it, it's it's really important to be able to do that because it's it's the you know eggs in one basket metaphor. The the more diversified you are, the better it's going to be for sure. Does does that answer? Kind of, okay. Yeah. Sure. Yes, sir. Do you do merchandise? Uh, I don't. I don't. I tried that once, twice, three times, a lady. I um, I uh, I did not have a good amount of success with that. And that was another one of those things, trying to find a pain point. And I just, I don't have the kind of audience that's looking for that. Um, I had a lot of people asking me to make shirts, uh, a, a really large amount of people who were fans of mine saying, we want shirts, we want shirts, we want shirts. So I designed, yeah. went to school for design. Hey, we'll put that to good use. I designed a few shirts. I put it out to my audience, said, all right, I want you guys to vote on them. And which ones do you want to see? So this one landslide, overwhelming, beat out all the other ones, printed them up, hardly any of them sold. And in fact, some of the people who were campaigning the loudest for the shirts, who voted for this one, didn't buy them. And so sometimes what your fan base or your customer base says they want might not be what they want. So you've really got to step into that cautiously. And so it wasn't long after that somebody was same thing started happening. I make posters for my shows and again, went to school for that so they don't look like garbage. Um, and I had quite a few people saying, we want to be able to buy your posters. We really <laughs> like the way these things look. They'd be great mounted on our you know, dorm room, whatever. Cool. Um, instead of printing up a bunch, because that's where you get your bulk discount and I'd make the most profit off of them if I did that way, I just put it up online and said, if you want these and you're, you're gonna buy them you know, through this PayPal cart, and then if they sell, I'm going to go down to FedEx Kinko's and you know, shoot these things off myself one at a time. I would profit about 25 cents off of them doing it that way. But I only had, I think, eight people buy them. So I felt like I saved myself in that because they got the posters they wanted. This mass of people who said they wanted them didn't wind up buying them. And I didn't you know, waste a bunch of money on it, and I also don't have a thousand boxes of posters stuck in my basement for the next five years. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you get your time for making audiobooks and also for your band to play? How do you get those people to hire? Well, who, okay. who, who's your target market, maybe, even for that matter? Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, the target market for each individual aspect of my business is completely different. And uh, have you guys talked about like customer avatars? for that kind of thing? We have, but okay. feel free to dive okay. in, yes. So um, for each individual aspect of my business, I have an ideal customer of like, this is the guy I'm aiming at, and I get really specific with it. So with my corporate client people, I have a name that this guy goes by, and I can imagine him in my mind, and what he looks like, what kind of car he drives, 
how many kids he's got, what area of the country he's in, like if he enjoyed the last Super Bowl halftime show or not. I get really, really specific with it. And so anytime I'm reaching out to somebody in that world trying to get a, uh, a festival gig or, or whatever, I'm aiming my email at them as though that's the person that I'm sending this to. Mm -hmm. If I'm posting um, even an Instagram photo that's supposed to reach that certain audience, I'm thinking what do they want to see? And with these other interests that they might have, how do I tie that in so that as they're scrolling through, they don't just see like, oh, there's Gregory Hyde going, hey, buy my new book. But it, it's like, you know, if they're, I don't know, really into cat toys or something, I somehow incorporate that into it. I, that's not an actual thing, but hopefully that gets the point across. But for audiobooks, um, there's a, a website called acx.com that uh, Amazon owns Audible books. And Audible has ACX set up as, I believe it's Audio Creators Exchange is what it stands for. And so that's a good way to do it. The other way to do it is to reach out to actual publishers of books and say, hey, I, you know, I see you released this book. I do those kinds of audio books. Here's a sample of my work. What do you think? And you can partner up with somebody that way. If you know an author who's looking to get an audio book produced, that's a, a good connection as well. So I've had luck with each of those scenarios so far. Um, with festivals, those are really difficult. Um, but most festivals, most restaurants, most private parties, corporate events, things like that, it's going to be a personal connection that gets you in the door. Hmm. Um, demos, so often, 99% of the time, a demo will not work. It absolutely won't. It'll get thrown on a pile of hundreds of thousands of other people who are trying to get into that same venue or that same festival, or that same thing. It's just. Uh, sometimes it works, very, very rarely, but it's usually a doomed enterprise and I don't even bother with it. So if I don't have a personal connection with it, I'm probably not getting in. So that's, that's the thing is you really need to have a network or, or some kind of a connection that somebody can say, hey, you should check my friend out because he's really incredible. He's going to be playing over here or some way that you can go in and say, hey, I'd love to be here. Here's what I do and, and making some kind of connection that way. Good, good stuff, good stuff. Good questions, folks. I've used in the past something called like gig something, and it was like I was looking for a performer in Chicago. Gig salad, gig salad. Oh, okay. <laughs> have you ever used anything like that? Like, have you had any success with it? I have, I have. I've had a, a couple of uh, opportunities come through there that, that were a good situation. Um, you know, they, they, take, they take a percentage of it. They also kind of, you know, broker the deal and everything, and... I don't know, maybe it's my inner control freak, but I kind of prefer <laughs> doing things on my own. But, but if I've got an open spot on my calendar and something comes through there, then I'm, I'm usually able to, to step out and take it. That's a good question right mm -hmm. there for sure. Um, yeah, but so I, I, I guess just real quick to say that I don't know anybody who, I know plenty of musicians who use that as a, a small supplement to what they do. I don't know of anybody who's able to sustain a career off of only going through Gig Salad or some other platform. Could they possibly use it to start out and then start building relationships and, and then it grows beyond Geek Salad? Sure, sure. Because, yeah, you're going to find those personal connections are what webs out your, your network and, and your next opportunities. I can trace, I don't know, 60% of every show I've ever played. I can trace back to one night playing the Hula Hands in Geneva Commons when one lady came up and grabbed my business card and hired me for her, 30th, her husband's 40th birthday party. And so from that, I picked up three more gigs that night from people who wanted to hire me for other things. Hmm. And then one of those guys owned a restaurant, so he started hiring me at his restaurant. And then these people, like somebody saw me at one of their parties, and then it just kind of went over here. And then eventually I'm on stage at House of Blues opening for Sister Hazel, and we've got a sold-out crowd in front of us, and I'm thinking I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been playing in Hula Hands that night. But, so, but it's, it's all those connections like that. Um, I played, my band played in New Jersey last weekend, and that gig would not have happened if I hadn't played a going away party for some people in Geneva like 10 years ago. And that party wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been playing at Hula Hands that night. So it's just, it's interesting how one thing can really explode and, and, and pan out like that. And, and I will even tout some of the, those of you who are trying to get started in, a, uh, in an industry or doing something, or maybe you have a skill set, but you don't have a lot of customers. There's a lot of platforms out there like a gig salad. Fiverr is one, Upwork is another. I'm a member mm -hmm. of one, you probably know Speaker Match, yeah. which is one also. Just again, to start 
developing relationships and networks that may blossom into bigger and better gigs. Who knows, yeah. for that matter? And there's a lot of different platforms out there. They call it the sharing economy now, where you can go out and um, identify your skill set and maybe find customers who want to work with you, for that matter. Mm -hmm. As we finish up, as we get from now near the end here, a couple more questions I got for you as well. Sure. So maybe um, you know we have a lot of students here who are aspiring entrepreneurs or aspiring experts in their own specific area. What is a personal habit maybe that you c that contributes or has contributed to your su success over the years? Is there something that you think that um, it, it could be the networking, maybe mm -hmm. some of the habits that you've spoken about already, but. Mm -hmm. What is it? You know, yeah, okay. um, yeah, the networking thing doesn't come naturally to me. Okay. I, I'm not, I mean, in an environment like this, I can kind of turn on a little bit, but uh, I'm naturally a major introvert. And so if I go to a party, the last thing I want to do is mingle. <laughs> I want to find a quiet spot and just you know, <laughs> in the corner. chill out. <laughs> um, so I have to force myself into the networking thing. Uh, definitely not a habit. Um, I would say uh, a habit that I have that has been beneficial, but it's also been detrimental, is um, I don't know how to turn off the, I don't know, for lack of a better term, hustle. Mm -hmm. So I, with my band, we played the biggest show we'd ever played. Uh, we played the Naperville Last Fling, so we played in front of, in front of like 6,000 people. Uh, it was an awesome festival event that we played, and that was the same week I launched my book. And so I was putting so much time in, building up to that, and there was all this talk with my wife, which there always is, of like, after, that, uh, after that's done, I'm just going to chill. I'm going to take a week off and just decompress. No, Monday hit, I'm right back at it. And she's like, I thought you were going to take the day off. I thought you were going to take the week off. I'm like, well, I kind of want to get started on this audio book. And um, so being able to, to turn off is, is really difficult for me. But the benefit of that is I, I don't succumb to laziness or, <laughs> you know, not... Uh, not being ready to go when the next opportunity shows up. And that's so. the passion though. Um, yeah. That you yeah. need as an entrepreneur to really get your career and business going. Yes. Yeah, because I absolutely love this. I mean, I thrive on it. I, I love preparing for uh, speaking at an event. I love the process of recording audiobooks. I love the process of mixing music. I, I just, man. I'm thrilled by all this. I like making my travel plans when you know I'm, I'm hired to, to play somewhere in another state. I, I just enjoy the whole process of booking my flights and all. I, I don't know, every bit of it, I'm like, I can't wait to get back to work. Um, I love my family dearly, they're great people. Um, <laughs> I, I enjoy every moment with them, but, but I really, really dig what I do. And yeah. And those of you who are really into it, into your passion or into this entrepreneurship game, you got to have a little bit of that. Some people call it like you're a little bit insane, but <laughs> don't get me wrong. I, 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 I understand t yeah. totally. And I, mm -hmm. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. So, but you know, not yeah. everybody does. Right. Yeah. My wife, God bless her. She's, she used to ask me like, when are, so what age do you want to retire? Like when you're like, retire, are you high? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not going to retire. Like that's nah, mm -mm. I'm always going to be doing something. So yeah. Last question, um, and I, I almost ask every guest that comes through here at the, the Entrepreneurship Club meetings this, this one question. If you were college age again, if you were sitting out here in the audience, right, and, okay. and, and knowing uh, then what you know now, mm -hmm. what would be different about your road? How, what would you do differently, and, and, and in turn, what advice is it that you could provide to these students who, and even our audience who's watching? Okay. Uh, well, that I would I would say is the networking piece. Really? That's that's where I I really fell down on things early on because I thought it wasn't so much about connections or the relationships that were being built. It was about how can I be the best musician I can be? How can I be as good at my craft as I possibly can be? Sure. And then things will work. And I didn't realize how important those network connections are. And not in a uh, not in a, any sort of an insincere way, because there are people who will go to a convention or something, and they're like, "I'm here to network. I'm gonna, you know, yeah, like yeah. pass out as many cards as I can." And hey, I know this guy now, and here's my picture with him. And, and yeah, it seems very disingenuous, and that kind of thing won't work. It's got to be. I'm I'm seeking to make as many friends as I possibly can. I'm trying to seek to make as many people, put as many people in my circle that I can help as I can. How can I find people that I can benefit them in some way? Because that's going to naturally come back to me. Yeah. And 
I didn't, I didn't get that. And in the music world, that's, that's really obvious in the, in the way of most venues will only book bands that bring people out because they want butts in their seats or they want people buying booze is what they want because that's where they're making their money. And if you can't do that, you could be the greatest band in the world, but you're not going to get booked very often. And I didn't, I didn't, that didn't make any sense to me. We would, my band would play places and they'd be like, oh, you're the best band we've ever had. Uh, sorry, we're not going to book you here again. <laughs> and we were crushed. And, and uh, I had a, a buddy of mine back in Tulsa. I mentioned this in the book a little bit. Um, he was no good at all. He was really, really awful because he didn't want to be a professional musician. He was actually going into accounting or something. But he would play with some buddies of his on the weekends, and they would just do like acoustic guitar versions of you know 80s rap songs or Britney Spears covers, and it was just kind of goofy and fun. But he was such a likable guy, and he was one of those guys on campus that like everybody knew him. Like you could bump into somebody, no matter how random, and it was like, do you know Jeff? You know, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, but he could get like 100 people out to a show on a weekend, and I could get 13. <laughs> <laughs> but he stunk, but he was so cool, and everybody loved him, and I loved him. And um, so many people would go out to see him, and these venues, they loved working with him. He was a great guy to hang out with, and they were like, oh, well, who cares if his music isn't any good? We just, you know, made right. one of the best nights of the month we've ever had. And, and so I didn't get the importance of, of that kind of building a network in a positive way like that. Um, so I definitely would have approached that with, with a lot more tenacity in my younger years. Yeah. Good, good, good stuff, good stuff. Um, and uh, one thing I like about what you said is the, the being genuine in that as well, mm -hmm. trying to make friends. Is, and sometimes when you're hungry for money, you forget that, you know, that's not the most important thing. Right. And if you're going out and really trying to help other people, that karma thing, I always say, is going to come <laughs> back around. And mm -hmm. it's just funny how that works is when you're not expecting it, that, that, that opportunity comes back around, you know? Yeah. And, and you never know where these people are going to go. I mean, some of the people that I knew back then that I didn't reach out to went on to be signed to major label <laughs> contracts um, who would have been really good people to, to be in touch with. And then after the fact, it just seems like I'm kind of a sycophant who's, you know, <laughs> hey, remember me? No, we never hung, you know? Um, so there's that kind of thing. Um, a guy I met at a party out here in, in the Burbs, he wasn't any working for any major corporation or anything like that back then, but he went on to be the vice president of Samsung, and now he's the president of Sharp. Who knew? But I'm glad that I was cool to him. <laughs> when, when, you know, he originally we were just both fans of like Wilco. I played a Wilco song that night. He was like, "Oh, I love Wilco." I was like, "Yeah, so do I." So we started chatting, and we went out for a beer a couple of times after that. And man, it's been a really—he's been a really great connection, but he's been a really good friend. I mean, uh, above and beyond that for sure. So. Yeah. Good stuff. Let's give Gregory Hyde a hand, folks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for being yeah. here. Truly appreciate Thanks it. Me. Thanks for you guys here being here also. And those of you watching, thank you for joining the Codex Show episode number 14 once again. Stay tuned for our next show coming up very soon. And until then, God bless.